Hello again to all subscribers and listeners of this channel. You tune into Obsidian Radio, and today I will be posting the last part of the series going over the 12 ancient superstructures erected by human beings all over the world. 12 ancient superstructures that are not in Egypt. This is part 3 of the series. We're going through sites 9 through 12. And again, I've stated this before, I'll say it again. This series was created to open people's minds up to the other monuments that human beings created. That way we could see much more of who we are, what our ancestors were ancestors were capable of and what we're capable of as homo sapiens sapiens so without further ado let's get into the final leg of our series site number nine the Menashi Aman temple of India what is it the Menashi Temple is a massive temple structure erected for the reverence of Menashi, who is an avatar goddess of Parvati, and her consort, Sundarashwar, who is a form of Shiva. So basically this temple is erected to give reverence to both these two deities within the Indian or the Hindu pantheon. Who built it? The original builders of the temples were the Tamil settlers of the area at the time. Who discovered it? Because of the long-standing preservation efforts of different governments within India throughout the centuries, the temple has never been forgotten, nor lost or abandoned by or to the people of the Madurai city. So it's always been in use, always been in knowledge, always been respected and protected in some way ever since it got basically rebuilt by what is that, like 700, 800 years ago? Let's continue. Who inherited it? Since its construction, the Temple of Menakshi has never been fully abandoned. In fact, for quite some time, many Indian governments have gone to great lengths to preserve this sacred temple, keeping it in excellent condition to this day. Where is it located? The Menakshi Temple is located in the city of Madurai in Tamil Nadu state in India towards the southern tip of India and its exact coordinates are 9 degrees 55 minutes 10 seconds north and 78 degrees 7 minutes 10 seconds east when was it constructed most information I could find puts its construction at around 600 CE or just under about 1500 years ago although it had been destroyed by Muslim invaders but many Hindu artists, architects, sculptors, etc. rebuilt the temple soon after, within about a century or a couple centuries or so. Why was it built? It was built to honor the honor and to highly or the highly respected Hindu deities, Manakshi, and as Meenakshi and her consort Sundarajwar. It was also built to honor the creation myths and many, many other deities within the Hindu pantheon, as well as the animals, gods, avatars, and demons that existed within said pantheon. Construction style. Somewhat similar to Angkor Wat, the Manakshi temple is mostly made of stone towers and walls that are concentric, as in there are walls and towers within walls and towers within more walls and towers. Think of a circle that is going to repeat, but get bigger on the outwards, kind of similar to the Russian dolls. These towers and walls lie at the center of the greater of of the greater Madure city, and are built to be very tall and extravagant. The entire structure seems to be covered in brightly painted sculptures of animals, humans, gods, and demons. Interesting facts about the ancient superstructure. The many facts that we have about the structure, many of them actually. One, the Manashi Temple is one of the most colorful temples ever constructed. Seemingly every inch seems to be covered in 
vibrant coloration. Bright blues, pinks, oranges, greens, etc. Two, the temple was destroyed roughly a thousand years ago by Arab invaders. But within three to four hundred years later, much of the temple was rebuilt. Three, the Menakshi temple is repainted and recolored roughly every 12 years by artists, painters, and other preservers of the highly decorated ancient temple by the Indian and other governments within India. Four, the temple draws in more than a million visitors every year when it comes to tourism. Site 10, or site number 10. The Ranikot Fort in Pakistan. What is it? The Ranikot Fort of Pakistan was a military fortification built to surround and protect an ethnic kingdom, most likely the Talpur's kingdom, who ruled in about the 1600s or so. Who built it? There's not enough evidence pointing to a distinct group when it comes to the construction. But the evidence that has been found does point to the Talpers and, and an, eth- an ethnic group that did rule what is now southern Pakistan many uh, a few centuries ago. Who discovered it? Because it was built fairly recently, within less than 500 years, it was not much of a discovery. It was a fort that the locals around the area were aware of since its construction. Who inherited it? The fort does not appear to have been Inherited. It was built some centuries ago. It apparently was damaged in some type of conflict, abandoned, and then eventually taken control of by the Pakistan government or the Pakistani government. Where is it located? The fort is located in or near the Kurthur mountain range in southern Pakistan. It lies within the, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the Jamshoro district of the state of Sindh in Pakistan. Again, southern Pakistan. Now, as far as its exact coordinates, its exact coordinates appear to be 25 degrees, 53 minutes, 47 seconds north. 67 degrees, 54 minutes, 9 seconds east. When was it constructed? According to the bit of archaeological research and historical research that has been conducted, the Ranikot Fort of Pakistan may have been built sometime around 1600 or 1700 CE. So again, roughly somewhere around 400 years ago or so. Why was it built? It may have been built originally as a military wall to stop invaders from breaching the particular kingdom that ruled at the time. Construction style. The fort is mostly a large, thick, and long wall with lookout towers and four major gates. The fort was also built connecting different hills and mountains to the fort's main structure, essentially blocking off all travel from the outside into parts of the mountain range where the fort is located. Interesting facts about the ancient superstructure. There's a few. One it is also known as the Great Wall of Sindh or sometimes referred to as the Great Wall of Pakistan. Two, its total length stretches just under 20 miles or 32 kilometers in length total. Three, it has been measured as being the largest and longest fort on the planet Earth ever discovered. Four, because of when it was discovered, Ranikot Fort technically should not be included on this list as ancient superstructure, but for the sake of brevity, it will be remain on this list as I choose it. Site number 11, the giant Longview Caves of China. I hope I'm announcing that right. What are the giant Longview Caves of China? What is it? What is the superstructure? The Longview Caves of China are a very massive man-made cave system filled with pillars, steps, and what appears to be layered walls with certain types of writing or symbols written onto them. Very beautiful if you get to see some pictures of it. Who built it? As far as we can see to this day, no one knows exactly who built these giant caves in China. 
in northern eastern China. Its creation is shrouded in mystery to this day. Who discovered it? The cave system was discovered in 1992 by a village local named Wu Anai or Wu Anai. He lived in the Longyu village and had been using local well water for regular chores like farming and fishing and cleaning and washing the clothes, washing dishes, stuff like that. So when he was doing that, he eventually became curious as how deep the village pond was. So when he and other villagers pulled money together, bought an electric pump, a hydraulic pump, and drained the pond, it apparently took them about, what was it, 17 to 18 days, or about two and a half weeks, to drain the pond fully. And once they did that, they discovered the entrance to the first of what eventually became, or what eventually was found to be the 24 massive man-made caves. Again, almost 30 years ago, they found this out, basically by accident. So, or through accident and mostly curiosity. So, who inherited it? It apparently was built thousands of years ago. It was left abandoned for many thousands of years. It was only recently discovered. Again, discovered only about a little less than 30 years ago. The Chinese government now has ownership of the cave, or at least some type of stewardship over the cave system which is now used to attract tourism. Where is the cave located? The caves are located in and around the city of Longyu, which lies within the Kuzhu Prefecture, which itself lies in the Zhejiang, or Zhejiang province in northeastern China. So again, the Kuzhu Prefecture, that lies within the Zhejiang, or Zhejiang province, and that province lies within northeastern China. The exact coordinates of the Longyu village, which is r- right next to where the caves are, are the coordinates are 29 degrees, 2 minutes and 7 seconds north. And also 119 degrees, 10 minutes and 58 seconds east. When was it constructed? When archaeologists studied the caves, they seemed to put an estimate of its construction to be around 200 to 300 BCE. So somewhere around 12, no, 22 to 2300 years ago, somewhere around there is when they accept it being constructed or the number they've uh, basically agreed upon based on the research. Why were these 24 caves built? No one knows what they were actually built for. They're not sure what these giant magnificent caves were actually built to represent, what they were used for. No one has been able to figure that out yet. There are images, pictograms, and symbols all over the walls, like I mentioned earlier. The walls have a lot of these interesting images all over them. But as far as we know, no one appears to have been able to decipher what any of these symbols and images on the walls of the caves actually represent or what they mean yet. So no deciphering of what is going on there yet. Again, a lot of mystery going on in these things. Very interesting. Construction style. The caves all seem to be made of carved rock that was somehow smoothed out into these layered and striated walls. It has large pillars inside that are running from the floor all the way up to the ceiling, as well as long corridors throughout each of the cave systems or throughout the cave system and throughout each of the caves. And the caves also seem to have these very interesting walls that separate each cave but never actually breach into each cave one by one. So somehow, when they were constructed, they were to construct them and keep all the caves very separate from each other with well-constructed walls that never got broken or they never got a door built into them or anything like that. So again, how these were built, no one really seems to understand. But the way they were built is very intricate and very interesting. As far as the interesting facts about these ancient superstructures, as far as the facts of these caves, there's quite a few interesting facts about them. One, the caves seem to show no signs of decay, no weathering, no structural damage of any sort. Two, 
There are 24 caves in total. Three. So far, only one of the caves allows for tourists to venture through it and do some sightseeing, take pictures, etc. The other 23 caves are blocked off and as far as I know, they're not allowed to have tourists or any other person venture into the other 23. Number four. No one seems to have figured out where the extra material that would have been dug out to create the caves, they're not sure where that material went. They haven't been able to find deposits of rock or stone or mud or anything anywhere in the surrounding area. So how they were dug out and where all the extra material went, they've never been able to figure that out despite more than a decade of research. Site number 12. The Bakoni Circles of South Africa. What is it? Or rather, what are the Bakoni Circles of South Africa? There are massive stone circles on the outskirts of Makatadorp in South Africa. And many of them seem to be intricate and interconnected in some way. Who built them? There are competing tales or ideas about who built these gigantic stone circles. One camp, led almost exclusively by Michael Tellinger, believes that they were built by ancient extraterrestrials. Others, such as Peter Delius, Tim Maggs, and Alex Schumann, or Schumann, are convinced that these giant circles were built by pre-colonial Africans, a.k.a. the Bakoni people, or the Kony people, as a form of advanced agriculture, or maybe even some type of structures built into ancient simple cities built by the Kony people or Bakoni people about five to 600 years ago. Those are the two main, main competing camps. Unfortunately, the former has gained a lot more traction than the latter, but I'll get into that later. Who discovered it? They are so massive and easily seen, especially from high vantage points, that they likely, like many other superstructures, had never been fully abandoned nor forgotten at least by the people that lived in the area, even after they fell out into disuse. Who inherited it? The people who live in the village of Makatadorp technically are the best candidates for at least inheriting some of these giant stone circles. Where are these giant stone circles located? The giant circular arrangements are massive and actually stretch into an area covering much ground. Makatadorp, also known by its official name of Into Kozweni, is situated near the center of the Impumalanga province in northeastern sections of South Africa. So again, let me say that again. <laughs> Makatadorp, also known as Into Kozweni, is situated near the center of Mpumalanga province and this province is in northeastern section of South Africa it's around this area where you're going to see large portions of these giant stone circles that actually stretch for a long distance the stone circles begin just outside the edge of Intokozweni and the coordinates closest to where the circles begin is going to be an area near 25 degrees 40 minutes and 0 seconds south also, 30 degrees, 15 minutes, and 0 seconds east. Again, you're looking very much at the Mpumalanga province towards northeastern portion of South Africa. When was it constructed? And this is another bizarre fact of this site. The age of the site is disputed as much as its builders. According to the ancient aliens hypothesis, the ancient extra ET ET hypothesis pushed again mostly by Michael Tellinger these circles are as much as 200,000 or even more years old so he's pushing these back towards the dawn of all humanity whereas other researchers who have been mentioned previously the three main researchers who have a book written about this they put the structures at between 500 to as much as maybe even a thousand years old at the most but most tend to sit at around 500 to 600 years old. Why were the stone circles built? Again, we have a split. 
One group believes they were built by ET civilizations that traveled to Earth many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And they were built as giant time-telling devices, energy-generating machines, as well as some type of device that had to do with mining gold in South Africa. Whereas the others, the other camp, who's a little more reasonable, they're convinced that these stone circles may have been remnants of an ancient city, an ancient farming agricultural city, that was based in that area and created by the local people 500 to 600 to maybe even up to 1,000 years ago. Again, ancient city, circular city, or city surrounded by hundreds of circles that focused on farming and agriculture. That's the second camp. Now, as far as the construction style, the circles are these interconnected circles of erected stone. Hundreds or even thousands of them placed all over the northern section of Mpumalanga, yeah, Mpu Malanga escarpment. The circles vary in size and seem to form intricate patterns resembling either village quarters or giant clock designs. Many of them appear to be large circles with smaller circles leading up to or away from the larger ones. So it's looking kind of like a giant necklace or kind of like those multi-hoop earrings. You'll see when you look at the pictures behind this video. Now, a lot of interesting facts about these ancient superstructures of South Africa, the giant circles. Very interesting facts indeed. One, because most people have not done a lot of their own independent research on these giant stone circles, many people are going to find most publicized versions of the Makatadorp stone circles in Michael Tellinger's work. Two, Michael Tellinger seems to be the lone voice, or at least the loudest voice, that has usually popularized the existence of these massive stone structures. Yet, he's also the one who has popularized the idea that they were created not by humans, not by Africans, but these giant stone circles were created by extraterrestrials. Number three, the stone circles of Makatadorp slash in Tokozweni actually are not in Makatador per se. They actually they actually cover an area within Makatador, some of Makatador, surrounding Makatador, and near the villages of Makatador slash in Tokozweni. They actually cover a huge area that is not just Makatador by itself. It'd be like if you were standing in Manhattan it's like, yeah, you're in Manhattan, but you're also in the greater New York area, too. Manhattan is not the only thing that's there. The four other boroughs are all part of New York City as a whole. These stone circles are very similar in that respect that if you stand near one stone circle, that's only one part of the entire structure. The rest of the structure is going to surround you in all directions for quite literally a few miles. It's very big. Even the pictures you're going to see in this are not going to truly depict how massive the entire thing is when you realize how many different circles have been constructed in this area. Number four, and like I was saying, the circles cover a large area, apparently, and I'm going to borrow a quote from this book. The book is called Forgotten World, the Stonewall Settlements of Malanga Escarpment, and I quote from the book, still visible today, is a vast expanse of man-made stones walling or mass man-made stone walling which connects over 10,000 square kilometers of land into a complex web of circular homesteads, towns, terrace fields, and linking roads stretching for 150 kilometers in almost continuous in an almost continuous belt. Unquote. And again, that comes from the book entitled Forgotten World, The Stonewall Settlements of Mpumalanga Escarpment. I'm going to have a link to that book in the description. But yeah, that book is written by the three guys, the three authors, who are breaking down a much more realistic, more logical explanation as to what the circles were, who built them, and what they were built for. But again, you're going to see that link in the description. So check that out when you're watching the video. Interesting fact number five. Apparently... Bakoni 
is spelled two different ways and maybe pronounced two different ways. I'm not sure which one's the correct way, but when I did some research for this, I saw Bacconi spelled B A capital K O N Y, and I saw the other spelling of B O capital K O N I. So I'm not sure which one's the correct one, but if anyone knows for sure which is the per- correct pronunciation, the correct spelling, let me know in the comment section below. Interesting fact number six Bacconi or Bacconi seems to mean land or country of the Coney people. Again, if anyone can clarify in the comment section, it will be greatly appreciated. Interesting fact number seven. Unfortunately for Michael Tellinger and fortunately for everyone else, the other researchers who have studied the Bacconi circles seem to be actual historians and or archaeologists who seem interested in South Africa's actual history instead of a rehashed Anunnaki idea basically copied and pasted from Zachariah Sitchin. Another ancient aliens hypothesis bites the dust, it seems. Also, I want to repeat the names of the three authors that have written that alternative, more realistic idea about what the Bakoni circles are. So again, that book that I mentioned, I'm going to put it, the link to it in the description. Again, the authors' names are three authors. They are Peter Delius, Tim Maggs, and Alex Shulman. They're the ones that wrote the book entitled, what was the title of the book? Forgotten World, The Stonewall Settlements of the Impumalanga Escarpment. They're the three authors of that book that break down a much more logical and objective basic facts and information about what the circles are, who built them, and what they're most likely built for. Bonus site, Orlante Tambo of Peru. And technically, just like the Ranicot Ford, this really shouldn't be in this list, but I decided to put it in there anyway because the history of this place is very interesting. So I want people to learn about this as much as possible. But let's get into it. Our bonus site, Orlante Tambo of Peru. What is it? Orlante Tambo is a city filled with giant stone structures dotted all over the entire place. From earth may terraces to ta- to tall standing stones or monoliths, lots of construction was done in this area. Who built it? The area now known as Olante Tambo was conquered and then constructed by the emperor whose name I believe was Pasha Kutek or Pasha Kuti. Who discovered it? It was never abandoned, therefore it was never discovered. Its existence was known since the day it was first constructed. Who inherited it? The people of modern Alante Tambo are basically the descendants of the original inhabitants. So much of the city still lies with the same bloodlines as the people that erected it and first lived there. Where is it located? The town of Alante Tambo, which is still a modern town, by the way. There's a lot of modern things going on that were built in and around the more older ancient stuff from centuries ago. This town is located along the Patacancha River, closer to the point where it joins the Willy Kunata River. It is situated in the Unumbaba province that lies in the center of the Cusco region in the southern area of Peru. I'll say that again. Olaita Tambo City is located in the Urumbo or yeah, Ur, Unumbo Urumbaba no Urumbaba Province. I'm hard to try pronouncing this. This province lies in the center of Cusco, the region of Cusco, and that Cusco region is in the lower middle center of Peru. And the exact coordinates you're looking for, if you want to find Olante Tambo, are 13 degrees, 15 minutes. 29 seconds south and 72, 72 degrees 15 minutes 48 seconds west this is right on the west coast of South America when was it constructed Olante Tambo and its many massive monuments were constructed sometime 
in the late 1400s or early 1500s, or around 1500 CE. Why was it built? It was built for a number of reasons. Let's break that down. Many of the structures were built to increase crop yields during farming and basically increase their ability to grow more food as they're an agricultural society. Other superstructures were built to be ceremonial and revered the gods and or members of the elite ruling class. And still other parts of the city were built as fortifications against the Spanish conquistadors. Construction style. So many different things were built in different ways throughout the city. The terraces were made of stone, walls, and moved earth, which increased the farming ability. The storehouses were made of what is called field stones and were built at high altitudes to store food and prevent food from decaying as quickly. Basically, they were like ancient, or not ancient, but older versions of ice boxes to keep harvested food cooler and last longer. Then there are the six monoliths of the Temple Hill, all of which were made out of large pieces of cut and fitted stone. Interesting facts about this ancient superstructure. A few interesting facts. 1. Olante Tambo is surrounded by mountains in almost all directions. This makes it a preferred place for a city to be protected from outside attack or outside invasion. Interesting fact number two. Alante Tambo has roads that connect it to both Machu Picchu in the west and the Pisac site in the east. Interesting fact number three. Alante Tambo, like many other superstructures outside of Europe, not only were more advanced than people give them credit for being but it also had a level of sophistication that could easily rival the level of advancement and sophistication seen throughout much of Europe within that same time frame. So a lot of people have this idea that what was going on in parts of the Middle East and going on in parts of Europe and Asia, some parts of Asia, that was like the most advanced thing that's going on. That's not necessarily true. There were places in the Americas, both North and South America, in the South Pacific, in Africa, even parts of Australia that actually were pretty advanced on a pretty similar level of advancement within that same time frame as what you saw throughout Europe and the Middle East. A lot of people don't want to accept that, but the archaeologists and the archaeological evidence and information would say different. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. And finally, I would like to end this series with this. 1. As stated in part 1 of this series, these videos were made to educate people about so many accomplishments by human beings all over the planet. As far as I'm concerned, we cannot continue to look at Egypt and the Egyptian pyramids and pretend that nothing else of any monumental scale was done anywhere else on the planet. We can't continue to pretend that nothing else was done except the Egyptian pyramids when it comes to what ancient people and ancient cultures were able to accomplish all over the globe. That's nonsense. To continue with this type of thinking shall unfortunately keep us very uninformed about who and what we are and what we were and what we can continue to be in the future as a species. Number two, another pet peeve that led me to create this series is the idea that anything outside of Egypt and also definitely anything outside of Europe throughout much of human history could not have been built by ordinary humans. It either was built by extraterrestrials, aliens, or some other quote-unquote superior quote-unquote race of people. Complete nonsense. And whether people mean to do this or not, doesn't matter. This idea continues to perpetuate the idea that darker skinned people all over the world, all over the planet, were too unintelligent and too unsophisticated to produce great works of art, technological advancement, or science. It's long overdue that that notion be put to rest. 
and put to rest once and for all. No longer shall we look at someone in South Asia or in the Pacific Islands, Central America, or in the entire continent of Africa. No longer can we look at these areas in these regions of the world and say to ourselves, quote, well, these people are primitive. They never could have built this. They never could have done all these things, unquote. It's time to end that. That type of ignorant and arrogant thinking has to go. And hopefully this series and other series like it produced by me and anyone else can bury that idea once and for all. Three. Human beings all over the globe are capable of doing great things. Human beings all over the globe in ancient times actually did great things on every continent. We in the modern age just have to expand our consciousness, open our minds, think critically, conduct thorough and accurate, correct research. And once we conduct that research the correct way, we need to accept what we see directly in front of us. There's no more need to try and pin everything ancient on aliens. We as homo sapiens sapiens really need to start recognizing our own awesomeness. And give credit where credit is due. That's all for now. Please like, subscribe, share, and donate to support this channel. And the content that I'm going to be producing on this channel. You all have a nice day. I'm out. Peace.